Section 14 of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. The Film of Fate, Part 1, by Josephine Dascom Bacon. Fifi's name was, I think, Sarah, not that I ever heard it. I suppose the bishop must have when he baptized her. She wore her father's grandmother's wedding veil, made into a christening robe on that occasion, and when the bishop asked her godparents if they, therefore, renounced in her name the world, the flesh, and the devil, Fifi gave a clear, distinct chuckle, which rang out through the Gothic arches. One of her godmothers, her Aunt Popsy, I forget what her real name is, too, one never hears it, looked very shocked and blushed violently at this. But everybody joked her mercilessly about it and said no wonder the child had laughed. The only wonder was, they said, that she had blushed. Fifi's family was very well known very rich and very fashionable. You will readily conclude having doubtless read a great many novels and seen a great many plays, that they were stupid and cold-hearted. I cannot blame you for this conclusion, which does you credit in a way, but I must stop you before you go any further and tell you you are quite in error. The Amorys were distinctly clever as a family, and far from cold-hearted, quite the contrary, in fact, if contemporary records are to be trusted. Stuvesant Amory, her father, said so many witty things that people never left the club until he did, for fear of missing one, and perhaps a little, so as to be sure that the next clever thing wouldn't be about them. Louise Schuler Crowlander, his wife's sister, would make the dullest dinner-party bearable, and his married daughter Patsy would not only make the most audaciously laughable remarks imaginable, but was wonderfully pretty and utterly well-dressed into the bargain. It is too bad to have to shudder all the illusions of the really poor people, who certainly ought to have the monopoly of brains and charms so obligingly handed over to them by the magazines. But it isn't so. Some of the nicest, jolliest, most entertaining people I ever met were quite wealthy. That was the real trouble with Fifi, her family. She would have been easier to handle if she hadn't had so much competition. Her brother Stu was the best dancer in New York, her older sister Patsy the wittiest young matron, her younger sister Pips was considered by many people the most beautiful girl, though that was really mostly hair, some other people thought. Fifi had only her undoubted gift for amateur dramatics, and they had been out rather for some time now. In any other family she would have been a noticeably handsome, clever girl, but the Amorys were too much for her, and in self-defense she made herself a little odd. She bobbed her dark hair, which didn't curl and wore unusual frocks, all in one piece with no waistline, and long, dangly chains. She read strange novels, and stranger poetry, and had her room done in purple tapestry, with ebony furniture. She walked in the park very early, with a Russian wolfhound, and had an idea once of learning to play the harp, but found it too hard on the hands. Once she almost created a sensation by insisting that she had become a Mohammedan, and this really bothered her mother for a few days, but the bishop said not to mind at all, that there were really many worthy Mohammedans, one in particular a great friend of his, who repaired oriental rugs. He would arrange for Fifi to meet him, and then, as the bishop pointed out, she needn't be confined to books in her religious researches. After that, of course, there was no good going on with it. Patsy had actually, the year before she was married, written some clever little epigrams, 
They were done for a Halloween party, and her friends insisted on their being published. Stu could pick up any instrument and make a bluff at playing something on it. He once, for a bet, strung some picture wire across a frying pan and sang Annie Laurie to his own accompaniment. Pips at fifteen developed what was apparently a gift for modeling, and made a table fountain that her teacher exhibited merely as a study. She took it up in the school infirmary after the measles. So that Fifi scorned the arts, and read, and walked with the wolfhound, and wore crisscross sandals like somebody in Miss Austen's books. She did write some poems, but they were discovered on the eve of publication. She always insisted and violently suppressed. Even the bishop was staggered by the poems. He suggested that, as he had baptized her and confirmed her, he would appreciate the privilege of marrying her, and hinted that it had better be soon, as he was growing old, and many more poems like that would certainly prove more than he could stand. But here again Fifi just missed things. Between Patsy, who gobbled up all the young men, she liked her own husband so much, her father said, that she had a sort of claim on everybody else's. And Pips, whom older men adored to the point of extravagance. She was one of those young girls whose mothers are begged by every man to keep her for his son, if he can't have her. Fifi more or less faded out. She was neither as daring as Patsy nor as magnetic as Pips, and her cleverness began to turn a little sharp, which frightened the men terribly. At twenty-two she looked three years older. Then the inevitable happened. Having had every opportunity to meet the most eligible young men in the country, and many of other countries, what does Miss Fifi do but fall in love with a man twenty years older than herself, whom nobody had ever heard of? This might have been put up with, but unfortunately the man had a perfectly good wife of his own, a wife, moreover, who had no intention of losing him to an unprincipled society girl of the fast set, as she called Fifi. This was all very messy and complicated, and poor Mr. Amory had a bad six months of it. Patsy had skated more than once on very thin ice, and Stu had given them a fair amount of anxiety, but their vagaries were more understandable, more normal, so to say. A short-haired martyr, languishing in a purple bedroom, insisting that she must have a middle-aged professor of English literature from some freshwater college, was a little too much for the Amorys. They had no system to oppose the conditions. The professor, however, saw reason, and never meant to let things go as far as they did. He was really attached to his wife and children, and had been momentarily dazzled by a personality, and a society type hitherto unknown to him. It was all over before it had got to be too ridiculous and painful, and Mrs. Amory took Fifi abroad, at great personal inconvenience to herself, and everybody proceeded to forget it. Everybody, that is, but Fifi. She had enjoyed it very much while it lasted, as it was the first time in her life since her arrival in the family, when for a few weeks she had managed to hold the center of the stage, that she had occupied everybody's attention. She had been really very fond of the professor, and the hours they had spent at tea-time, in odd places where there was no probability of anyone's meeting them, had been quite the most interesting hours of her life. She loved to think how his horrid, stupid wife misunderstood him, which wasn't entirely accurate, and how immensely happy she would have made him, which is possible but not, I think, certain. So that the European summer, though it accomplished its purpose, practically speaking, left her dreamy and superior. Events, as she wrote in her diary, didn't interest her. Too much was going on in her heart. The summer of 1914, which sent them scuttling home in a steamer packed like a sardine box, meant to Fifi only the disgustingly crowded decks and the difficulty of getting American money quickly. The Amorys, like most of the rich and fashionable people of New York, got into the war long before the rest of the country. 
strangely enough instead of exercising their pekingese and inventing new tango steps they experimented with war breads encouraged the english men servants to go home and enlist and busied themselves with pageants and tableaux and rummage sales and song recitals to send the great stream of american dollars that flowed to belgian relief patsy became the first secretary for the american fund for french wounded and worked all day at it long before the lusitania was sunk she had sent her eight hundredth bale of clothes and bandages and comforts across the wickedly dangerous atlantic stew dashed back into squadron a and was one of the first workers at the new aviation units mrs amory was lost in the meshes of the great practical reorganization of the red cross pips and three of her schoolmates started a cigarette and chocolate fund that soon outgrew their homes and ended in a vacant shop on madison avenue with a paid secretary and an auditor so efficiently did the young ladies manage an experiment which amused their families so much till the published totals of their collections began to rouse attention in the daily papers only fifi remained outside unswept into the great maelstrom i don't admire her for her self-centered thin-skinned little attitude only you mustn't condemn her for it either the girl simply hadn't found herself and the war hadn't done it for her she walked with the big hound in the park and read a great deal of french verse she thought the women's new craze for uniforming themselves supremely silly and pointed it out to her friends so clearly that they did not urge her to join them she was going she said to design a uniform for the few females left who weren't wearing any her father quoted this at the club. Well, the war wore along. Fifi hardly noticed that we were in it at last. Her family had always been in it. Stu was a major already. Mr. Amory had given and loaned so much money that heeding even one country place became a matter of close consideration. They regretted Fifi's tepid, sarcastic isolation but had little time or temper to give to it. Only once, when she said in her detached, drawling way that the sight of a woman knitting in a Fifth Avenue bus made her positively ill, her father turned on her. "'Don't you think this comes rather badly from you, my dear?' he said. "'I believe this to be the harshest remark Stuvescent Amory ever addressed to a woman in his own family.' Now we have come to the day when Fifi— sitting wearily through a war workers dinner that was to bring ten thousand dollars and signed pledges to mrs amory after the coffee listened to a chance remark of a clever discontented woman who suffered a little from her own malady of destructive criticism all this is very well said the woman who was divided between satisfaction at actually dining with the stew amorys and dissatisfaction because she knew full well why she had been invited all this is very well but your precious sammy is being stuffed with chocolates and fags and musical records and mufflers while his poor wife is doing his work it's just like women to pet the men and neglect their wives and children isn't it that's a wonderful idea mrs amory cried enthusiastically and you're just the woman to remedy that my dear why don't you take it up everybody applauded and the woman found herself a chairman before she left the table as fifi had agreed with her first remark and was notoriously disengaged she accepted with amused condescension a place on the executive committee and mr amory's airy suggestion of the little sisters of uncle sam was adopted unanimously well there you have it on tuesday an idea on wednesday a committee on thursday a headquarters on friday stamped letter paper the little sisters was booming in a fortnight you must take the publicity miss amory you're our only literary light said the chairman and fifi blushing slightly deprecating but really very much pleased consented they had their pictures taken in the picturesque capes with terracotta lining evolved by new york's principal sporting tailor for the occasions of their sisterly visits to sammy's relatives 
Fifi quite forgot her feeling on the matter of superfluous uniforms, and they were interviewed by the Sunday Times and the Saturday Sun. After that, really novel publicity proved difficult. People must take this more seriously, the chairman mused. If they only knew what practical, vital work we were doing, we must get it across to them somehow. What can we do, Miss Amory? Think of something. You are so clever. Why not? said Fifi sardonically, for the little sisters were beginning to bore her. Why not get it into the movies? That will put it across like the other war pictures. To her surprise, they caught at the suggestion wildly. Wonderful, they cried. My dear, you are simply too wonderful. Who shall we have to do it? And then in the next breath. Why, you, of course, Miss Amory. You write. You'll do it, won't you? Me, but I never wrote a— And all your dramatics. Why, you're practically a professional, everybody says. You're just the one. You'll know how to make it effective and— And plenty of go, you know. I might try, said Fifi slowly. You could show the soldier going away, and the house running down, and the mother sick and everything, and then the girls could show the home nursing, and the first aid and the recreation. There's our junior camp, you know, and all the other stunts. Oh, my dear, how perfectly wonderful, they cried. What will it cost, do you think? The war had caught Fifi at last. The next day but one she found herself sitting opposite a keen, polite gentleman at the little sister's headquarters, explaining somewhat nervously her idea of a moving picture. She talked a great deal and very fast. "'Of course I don't know anything about this,' she concluded breathlessly, "'but I've written out a little plot of—of of a sort of scenario, isn't it?' "'Give it here,' said the dark gentleman abruptly. "'Got the script here.' I suppose you want about two thousand feet. You gotta have two thousand feet. First twenty minutes to get the thing across. Regular rule. All worked out. Get some warmed up. I suppose you can put your hand on the cast for this. Oh! Fifi gasped, for he appeared to be reading her manuscript with one hand, and talking to her with the other, so to speak. Oh, there isn't any cast really, you see, just the little sisters themselves. Your sisters? I see. Young ladies in the league. Amateurs. All the better. Can't act, but the public likes it. Good title. Very good. We'll get you the soldier and the family up at the studio. Not practical, staging indoor stuff as a rule out of the studio. Not enough voltage. It can be done, of course. We can run wires anywhere, but cost like thunder in the end. Studio scenes at a hundred a day. A hundred? Fifi queried confusedly. Dollars. Five hundred a reel outside. Four hundred, really, but allow one studio day to each. A thousand for the two. Cover everything. Transportation, mostly. Machine very delicate. Fine effects here for the children in camp, I see. Fifi perceived that the marvelous man had really read the manuscript and seen what she had intended to convey. Then you think you could do something with it? Make it over, I mean? She asked humbly. Very good script indeed, he answered briskly. Practically no suggestions myself. Good captions, too. They have to add to em a little here and there. Average house, perfect fools, you know. Minds travel slow. You mean it will do as it is? Of course it'll do. Very good script. Much better than I expected, he snapped. My goodness gracious! She breathed and rushed into the committee room to report. In five minutes she had raised the money required. Two of the finance committee agreed to underwrite the film. Now I may have given you a lower idea of Fifi's powers than his quite just to the child. She had done the little sister's film very cleverly. She had a really dramatic mind, you see, and instead of presenting a series of pictures of the activities of her particular organization, she had selected one little girl in a poor soldier's family to be the object of all the direct and indirect advantages flowing from the little sisters of Uncle Sam. This made a more or less connected narrative and centered the interest in the child in question, whom she hoped to pick from the vacation camp supported by the little sisters, where happy relays of two weeks' guests swam and drilled and cooked and slept in the open. Fifi had instinctively realized that this camp, though only one of their activities, would make the best showing on the screen, and had laid many of her scenes there. 
building up the picture from the prospectus of the Committee on Activities and the glowing reports of the camp directoress, an experienced social worker. "'I suppose there's no doubt the kids can do all these stunts,' suggested Mr. Ficken on the occasion of his second visit to headquarters, to arrange for his sleeping and eating accommodations during the camp days ahead of them. "'Oh, I don't think so,' Fifi answered vaguely. "'That's what they're there for, isn't it?' "'All right. Up to you,' he said briefly. "'Take us five days. Only three, really, but allow for bad weather. My assistant and a cameraman and a chauffeur. Your camp lady says tea house will do for us, three miles from her outfit. You going up by train?' "'I suppose so.' she answered vaguely, wondering if her father would let her have the small car for that length of time, and perhaps the second chauffeur, who was rather stupid and liable to be drafted any day into the bargain. "'We can take you up,' he added suddenly. "'Stick you in, I dare say. If you don't mind cameras, car's a seven-passenger.' So that Miss Fifi Amory found herself battened down on the back seat of a dingy but powerful car under a pile of blankets and tripods, between Mr. Ficken and his photographer, a mild, short-sighted little man with a pointed beard and an apologetic manner. Beside the chauffeur, a headstrong New York cockney in a flannel shirt, sat the assistant, a taciturn young man with a scornful expression and a tendency to disagree with everybody as to their exact whereabouts at any given time the likelihood of their arriving at the camp at all, and the possibility of getting any pictures that week, as he had read in the only paper he ever perused, a western publication, that the next seven days would be cloudy. Fifi thought them all immensely amusing. That they thought of her at all is extremely doubtful, for you see they had no idea who she was. Mr. Ficken had been summoned to their interview by a pompous lady with a rope of pearls too big not to be real. The other ladies in the office called each other by their first names, but they called her Miss Amory. He saw a slender, odd-looking girl with bobbed hair, a queer-looking velvet frock, and a jet chain down to her knees. Her shoes were different from other people's, an excited spot of carmine on each cheekbone he mistook for rouge, her coldness when addressed by the lady with the pearls he took for shyness. He placed her somewhere between a newspaper woman and an actress, and gave the matter no further thought. The little scenario was a pleasant surprise for him. He usually had to write them over. Mrs. Amory had no idea that Fifi was to be the only woman of the party. She knew that the directoress of the camp was a perfectly capable matron, and that Fifi would be in her tent during her stay. There were only girls and young women there, and men were all she feared in her daughter's case, ever since the episode of the Professor of English. Naturally, she didn't count the picture-taking persons as men at all. She gave her daughter blankets and bed-boots and a trench mirror she had bought at a bazaar for a soldier, and told her maid to see that Miss Fifi's maid put in a pair of high boots and plenty of woolen sport stockings. Then she went back to the Red Cross. If she had seen her daughter eating lunch at a Yonkers tea house, with a taciturn young man who smoked cigarettes steadily through the meal, she might have been considerably more disturbed than she was that day. I guess you and the young lady better grab a table, loot, and the boss and I leave out here and keep an eye on the car. Henry has to chase out for some distilled water, or so he says, the little photographer remarked, and the young man answered indifferently. All right, anything suits me. "'This is great fun, isn't it, Mr. Leert? Fifi gurgled, stuffing tea-house chicken pie with gusto. "'Anything's fun if you say so, I suppose,' he answered absently, pulling out an old envelope and jotting down figures on it while he ate. She flushed a little, but decided to take it humorously. "'What do you think is fun?' she said good-naturedly. "'Oh, well,' he replied vaguely and drank a great cup of coffee in two gulps, his eyes on his figures. She bit her lip and ate in silence, which— evidently impressed him as little as her speech, he was no more of a lady's man than his boss. Once at the camp, events moved fast. A lot of excitable little girls of uneven sizes and dispositions were lined up before Fifi and Director Ficken, from which wriggling mass they were to select a heroine for their melodrama. "'I'll pick them out for screen types, and you find out if they're good for the stunts,' he said hastily. 
Get all this camp stuff out of the way first, and take him to the village for street scenes. How about your young society girl stuff? Forgot to bring one, didn't we? Wasn't she to come in in the village part? He looked annoyed. An able man, considering all things in their proper place and order, he had been neglectful. Oh, I'll do that, said Fifi easily. She doesn't come in much, you know. He scratched his head thoughtfully. Hmm, yes. I guess we'll have to let it go at that, he agreed. Too bad we didn't think of it, though. You couldn't have got one of those regular members, a real Astorbilt or something. We must try to for the studio scenes. Make a note of it, both of us. Public likes it. Fifi was honestly puzzled. Why wouldn't she do? She had been one of the principal features of the debutante's league film, and much in demand for it. Did he think her too old, perhaps, or not enough of a novelty? She decided that he feared she couldn't act and manage at the same time. That tall girl with the blue eyes would be awfully good, I think, she suggested, but he shook a decided head. Look, sixteen, nineteen in the picture. No point in it. Might be an actress. Want to be convincing. How about the dark, wavy-haired one? Three from the end, always laughing, fine eyes. And that clever, short one just behind. She's very graceful. They collected five promising young ladies and reported to the directoress. But Mrs. Compton shook her neat braided head with fatal displeasure. Oh, dear me, Miss Amory, that will never do. You can't pick out the pretty ones like that very well. They're jealous enough already. Two girls left last night because I told them they couldn't be in the drill scenes. But we must have them good-looking, Mrs. Compton. They're to be the principal ones. All the more reason for picking them out for some good reason, said Mrs. Compton firmly. Now all those girls you have selected would be the very worst ones possible. Beatrice is regularly late for reverie each morning. Helen Priestley gets bad marks for her tent every night, laughing and talking. Alma is self-conscious and affected enough without having her head turned by this sort of thing. Fifi gazed at her in dumb despair. Her plump and placid bulk, her sweet reasonableness, her firm matronly readiness for every juvenile emergency put her beyond the reach of argument. Who? Which ones can we have, then? The impresario asked meekly. Well, said Mrs. Compton judicially, there is a fine girl here who's made a lot of progress. I'm much interested in her, Miss Amory, and I'm sure that all the young ladies who have done so much to make the camp possible will be, too. She swims well and does excellent first aid and really understands camp cooking. That sandy-haired girl, the second from the right on the third row, Sadie Rottenkind. She's not pretty, of course, but she has a fine, serious face when you study it. I'll ask Mr. Ficken, Fifi murmured after a hasty glance at Sadie. Mr. Ficken threw up his hands and yelped nervously. Good God, he cried, what's the matter with this woman anyway? What we come up here for? To make a picture or give rewards for merit? That's not up to us. Tell her. Tell her we're here to get something over. How about that fat little blonde one in the back there? She'd scream first rate. Fifi inquired and came back sadly. No. What's her trouble? He queried sourly. She only came last night. She hasn't got the real atmosphere of the camp yet. She's got atmosphere enough for me, he answered obstinately. Tell her to can that Sadie stuff anyhow. Start him on some games and marching to begin. We'll never get anywhere this way. Fifi was to remember those four days in camp as the strangest of her life. End of section 14 Recording by Capricia Page Section 15 of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. The Film of Fate, Part 2, by Josephine Dascom Bacon. From half-past six, 
when the uncertain notes of Sadie Rottenkind's somewhat amateurist reverie waked her to a sketchy toilet in an agate basin and a variable cup of coffee in the mess tent to nine at night when the last giggling infant had been sternly suppressed by mrs compton's awful visit in a mackintosh over her nightgown fifi bustled and hustled those protesting little girls from drill ground to lakeside from the manufacture of flapjacks to the splints and bandages of theatrical casualties in one ear rang the matron's perpetual plaint this is going to be very bad for these girls miss amory all my discipline is being steadily undone in the other mr ficken grumbled in a nerve-racked tenor look here tell her this is a motion picture act will you not a y w c a we got to get some pep into this and poor fifi would explain pacifically to him i know but you see after all that's what the children are here for really she's so good to them and to the outraged educator of youth she would murmur deprecatingly you see all he thinks of is the effect and after all that's what we're here for isn't it both of them found her decidedly weak and inefficient the only one that gets a thing out of these kids is me said mr lute he answered to that name as well as hunt kansas or bill because you stuff them with those dreadfully sticky lollipops fifi answered severely i do wish mr lute you wouldn't do it mrs compton is furious about it if you'd only give it to the good ones she says i wouldn't spend much in that case he vouched safe she earns her money if you ask me that lady she surely does fifi could not make him out he was like no one she had ever seen before far less clever than mr ficken he was in his odd way more of a gentleman he knew less about motion picture technique than the shy little assistant who nevertheless treated him with marked respect a solitary young man he ate mostly alone or took a sandwich with the chauffeur with whom he held interminable arguments as to the conduct and condition of the big dusty car oh all right general all right the chauffeur would reply disgustedly anyway you say of course why does he call you general fifi asked abruptly on the third day as they sat eating cold baked beans on the bank of the lake out of sight and sound of the children who were recovering their various tempers after a trying morning of touching picnic poses same reason you call me loot i suppose he answered i'm a lieutenant in the army oh my goodness i thought it was your name she said what are you doing here then your name is hunt i suppose kansas is another nickname yes'm hunt bill hunt he replied i i was gassed the doctor said i must keep out in the air if i get indoors much i cough and i wanted to understand this motion picture stuff there's nobody in the business like old ficken gassed you mean in france no ma'am i never saw france that's what seems so silly they were trying it out in the camp where i was and some of us offered for the experiment and i happened to get it bad that's all i went south for the winter and spring and i'm supposed to keep outdoors till this winter and then they say i'll be all right what a shame she murmured he was a fine manly sort of fellow very vital and active if not really good-looking and his sulkiness seemed quite understandable when one knew what he had gone through oh well he said in his characteristic drawling way and fell to figuring again on his eternal old envelope that morning had been a gray one and soon a sudden shower blew up and spoiled the afternoon carryalls were summoned for the damp and protesting children and the hospitable mrs compton offered supper for all and bunks for the men in the big hay barn for the sheets of rain poured furiously down and lieutenant hunt promised the same distressing conditions for the next day fifi was bored blue and suddenly hopeless the pictures appeared all at once banal to a degree the little sisters ridiculous and meddling even the children were tired of the endless posing the countless lectures from mrs compton the nervous heckling of director ficken 
Fifi herself, unconscious of the fact that they all believed her to be an actress, grew weary of their fevered questions as to the life on the stage and the road, and resented their plain incredulity when she explained her ignorance of these things. I wish that priestly girl would stop asking me if I ever knew Belasco. She complained bitterly to Lieutenant Hunt, and, oh, I wish that disgusting little Alma would stop trying to look like Mary Pickford. Well, you can't blame em, he said, lighting the pipe Mrs. Compton allowed him. All girls get stage-struck, I guess, and having you here and Ficken and all. But good heavens, I never saw Belasco in my life, she complained. No, didn't you? he returned. Well, there's lots you have seen, I guess. <laughs> oh, yes, she agreed listlessly. She was very tired, and the days before them in the studio in town were not so interesting somehow, as they had promised before the monotonous round of posing and practice began. In the first place, Hunt would not be there, and she knew that she was going to miss his quaint, unconscious rudeness. Nobody had ever treated her so brusquely, so flatly. He assumed with perfect simplicity that she was necessarily ignorant of most of the important things of life. Of course, being a woman, you couldn't understand, was one of his most characteristic sentences. Ladies, of course, don't care for that sort of thing, was another. When sometimes, in desperation, she had treated him to one or two of the cynical epigrams that had so amused and amazed her professor, his pained and averted silence had left her as embarrassed as he. The give and take of the girls and boys of her own set was absolutely unthinkable to him clearly. His crudeness exasperated, yet fascinated her, and she insisted upon engaging him in conversations, which ended in long monologues by him on the essential proprieties as misunderstood by young women of the eastern states. Thank God our girls out home are raised differently, he would end. I wouldn't marry a girl from the East if she was the last one on earth. Do you find us so pressing here? She would query satirically. Oh, well, nobody wants to die an old maid, he would answer placidly, stuffing his pipe. Oh, rot! Really, Mr. Hunt, you are too absurd. Plenty of my friends aren't married and don't intend to be, she would inform him. They have a much better time as they are. I guess the less said about that, the better, he would answer briefly. And just what do you mean by that? I've nothing more to say, no, ma'am. She would walk to her tent with dignity and compose speeches witheringly ironical before she slept, but he never heard them. At last the job was done, the scattered bits so jerky, so unrelated, which Mr. Ficken assured her would fit neatly into a smoothly flowing story, were ready to be assembled, and in a burst of lollipops and cheering they left the camp, a nearly disorganized community. "'Good-bye, girls, keep off the stage,' Lieutenant Hunt called cheerily, turning with a defiant glance from his seat beside the chauffeur to meet Fifi's eyes. "'Why does he look at me like that?' she wondered to herself, and later at their lunch, in some noisy wayside inn, she marveled still more at his stiff apology. "'I shouldn't have said what I did back there,' he said abruptly. "'But I meant it. Before God I meant it. And I can't help it. So you can take it or leave it.' "'I haven't the least idea what you mean, Mr. Hunt,' she answered with her most insolent amory intonation. "'I guess you know well enough. I'll be saying good-bye here.' I'm sorry we haven't been better friends, Miss Amory, honest I am, but my ideas are different. She glanced up at his tall, slim, young stiffness from under her bobbed hair. When you've been longer in the East, Lieutenant, you'll learn that we don't pick our friends in quite, quite such a casual way, she drawled smoothly. You might do worse, he said. Goodbye. Alone with Ficken and the photographer, a great and nervous fatigue caught her, and her throat swelled and ached. She put her face against the dingy cushions and cried quietly from Yonkers to the little sister's headquarters. "'Don't you be worried about the film stuff, Miss Amory,' the director reassured her. 
It's only the stills that might be rotten. That young Kansas doughboy mixed those plates for fair. I'm just about certain. He's good in some ways, but I made the mistake of my life not to manage my own camera on the stills. He thinks he knows it all, that boy. He certainly does, said Fifi. I'll bring the young ladies up to the studio tomorrow. Have you your list of everything? Kitchen set, he shot at her. Bed for invalid, sheets, and so forth. Poor cottage interior. Got to hunt round for outside house. Somewhere in the Bronx. Report tomorrow on that. Baby, any particular age, did you say? Bathtub, piano, soldier, non-commissioned officer's uniform. Turkey ready for stuffing. Mother in widow's costume. Have him up there at eleven sharp. Don't let your debutantes make up. Absolutely unnecessary. I'm afraid I can't do much about that, said Fifi with a wan smile. But I'll do the best I can for you, Mr. Ficken. She was bitterly sorry she had ever gotten into the thing, which is a state of mind common at one time or another to all uplifters. Nor was her disillusionment relieved by the contingent of little sisters sent her from headquarters on the morrow. Dear Fee, wrote her best friend on the board, whose presence she had counted upon to share any amusement there might be in the day, we have decided to send up for the picture five or six girls I don't think you've ever met. They're a little bit sore about their local branches not getting any notice, and we thought this would be a fine way to square them, do you see? Lila Betts is the one from our crowd. I know you and she don't hit it off very well, but Mr. Betts has offered to give us a big benefit performance of the film in his village casino and serve tea to the entire audience, so please put up with her. They're all crazy about it. It must be too exciting for words. Best love. Fifi grinned stoically. Mr. Ficken had promised to work it all into one day. When they arrived at the great barn-like studio, the little sisters giggling hysterically in their terracotta capes as they dismissed their chauffeurs for the day, the first shock of their professional careers awaited them. Instead of the humble soldier's cottage they had expected to find, awaiting their sisterly ministrations, a lordly townhouse of the decorative period consecrated to the moving picture filled two-thirds of the place. A butler, a husband and a French maid posed under a great cluster of lights amid the tapestries and statuary of a wealthy screen family. As the butler resembled Macbeth, and the maid was clearly a chorus girl, and the husband looked like nothing in the world but a moving picture star, the initiated might readily conclude that this was a successful society drama. The lights hissed and roared. The carpenter pounded and built. The directors took off their coats and yelled at each other and everybody else under the great signs which read, No smoking. The cast assembled and lit one cigarette from another, tossing the unextinguished ends on the floor. And in an obscure corner, Ethel, the moving picture baby, wailed unceasingly. For years afterwards, whenever anything that resembled the hiss and roar of those terrible lights sounded near her, Fifi instinctively listened for the voice of Ethel. "'Always what you might expect up here,' Ficken yelled at them. "'Here's our date all made, and what do we get? "'They have an $80,000 picture on there, and naturally they can't take it down. "'Been at it all night. Through tomorrow, they swear. "'Suppose we go out with the car and hunt up our exterior somewhere. "'Get that out of the way.' "'So they all packed themselves into the car. "'Somehow,' and rode out for what seemed like endless hours, searching for the humble, neglected cottage of Fifi's scenario. One would have supposed it a fairly easy goal, but here the artistic temperament of Mr. Ficken rose and asserted itself incredibly. House after house was suggested to him, only to be scornfully discarded. The little sisters giggled. Somewhere around Pelham Bay he consulted his watch. "'Got room for one more?' he inquired. I asked Kansas to turn up about lunchtime for the stills. Just go to that subway that's somewhere round here, will you, Henry? He'll be there, I hope. Fifi drew a quick, uneven breath. So he was coming again after all. It would be amusing to hear his comments on the little sisters. It's a lovely day for a ride anyway, she said good-naturedly to Lila Betts. 
At the subway entrance, Mr. Hunt stood at ease, surveying the loaded car condescendingly. "'All you need is a few passengers,' he suggested. "'Good morning, Miss Amory. Hope you're well.' He stood on the running board and totally ignored the young ladies, exchanging professional amenities with the director. Fifi felt immensely entertained, and threw in a joking comment now and then. It all seemed rather a lark again, and the little sisters were not so bad after all. Some obscure inspiration led Mr. Ficken at last to select for his exterior a neat, prosperous little cottage within two miles of the studio, and he and his mild, middle-aged assistant proceeded to busy themselves at dismantling and untidying it, so to speak, in which process they collected loads of assorted rubbish and dumped them about in conspicuous places, so that the angels of mercy and reconstruction in the terracotta capes and aviators' caps could have a field for their regenerative labors. While they did this, Fifi and Mr. Hunt talked in low tones on the steps of the side porch, and the little sisters adjusted the angle of their caps and powdered their little noses. "'Isn't that terrible?' said Kansas, in a consecrated sort of way. "'What?' she asked innocently. "'What? Oh, Lord, I suppose it seems little enough to you I forgot,' he muttered. "'But to me, I tell you, Miss Amory, if I had a sister and she did that, well, I'd wash her face for her, and in a way she wouldn't forget in a hurry.' "'How funny you are,' she said gently. "'Why, that's nothing really, Mr. Hunt. All girls do that.' If you could see some of them now. I'll bet there's one there that doesn't, he answered obstinately. That lovely one with the yellow hair. She's a peach if there ever was one she is. I wouldn't mind meeting her. You can see what a lovely innocent girl she is, all right. And just to hear a curious, painful thing happened to Fifi. Inside her something tightened suddenly squeezed together as if a hand had grasped it. It cut her breath off, whatever it was, and hurt her abominably. Her lips tightened, and a slow, unbecoming red crept up her cheekbones, flooding out the little crimson discs of excitement that betray all Crowlanders, and that Mr. Hunt supposed to be artificial. "'You think so?' she said lightly. "'Dear, dear. I say, Lila, come here a minute, won't you?' Lila Betts, whom nature had provided with a skin like milk, who preferred, not entirely unreasonably, to look like a Killarney rose, hastened willingly to the side porch. "'Anything I can do?' she asked, gazing with a kindly, open, somewhat childish stare at the tall, well-poised young gentleman. "'Have you got your vanity box with you?' said Fifi easily. "'Surest thing you know,' Miss Betts returned good-naturedly holding out a little silver case. Take the pale pink if you like. It's my own special, and I don't often lend it. The dust is awful. Thanks, says Fifi. I only wanted some powder. That isn't my lipstick on the left, so don't try it. It's my cigarette holder, Miss Betts volunteered. But I left my case in the car. Worst luck. Let me present Mr. Hunt, Miss Betts. Fifi remarked smoothly. I must run away and see how far Mr. Ficken has got. I'll leave you to entertain Mr. Hunt, Lila. He directs the still pictures. I'm sorry, but I have to go, interrupted the Kansan gruffly, and stretched his long legs toward the group round the camera. Lila stared. A bit abrupt, your young friend, she suggested. They're a funny lot, said Fifi, and turned away. What a pig! What a beast I am, she muttered to herself. Why? Why did I do that? I wish I'd never seen him. She stumbled off behind the house, and there in a little woodshed he stood, smoking furiously. A nice set, he muttered to her, gloweringly. There's not much to choose between you. Actress or society girl, you're all the same. What do you mean? Who's an actress? She demanded as roughly as he. You are, aren't you? he asked. How do you dare say such a thing? Of course I'm not an actress. None of us are. You're not, he cried, his whole face softening. Honest? Then as she shook her head wonderingly, 
"'Wash that paint off your face, then,' he stormed, and he took a step toward her. "'Paint!' she cried angrily. "'What paint? Are you crazy? I never paint.' And as furious as he, she drew out a handkerchief, scrubbed it over her crimson cheeks and lips, and held it trembling out to him. There! she cried. He took her hand with a piece of linen in it, and appeared to study it. An unbearable rage possessed her. Oh! she gasped, and lifted her hand and slapped his bended cheek full and fair. Oh, would you? he muttered. "'You little spitfire, I'll show you!' And pressing her arms, helpless to her sides with one of his, he turned her face round and kissed her mouth. And then, and then only, did Fifi understand what had happened to her, and her professor, and her poetry, and her dramatics all melted out of her life forever. On the next day a tall and reasonably handsome young officer in freshly pressed khaki stood in her father's library. This is Lieutenant Hunt, Papa, from Kansas, but I'm going to marry him just the same, Fifi said. She had a coat and skirt and a silk shirtwaist on, because he liked them better, and the ends of her short hair were pinned in somehow, so you would never have guessed it was short. Mr. Amory looked at them with interest. Well, well, he remarked genially, and what's the matter with Kansas? I'm charmed to make your acquaintance, Lieutenant. You see, it was nothing like the books. He neither curled his lips scornfully, nor rang for the butler to kick the young man downstairs. Instead, he told that uninterested menial to bring some whiskey and soda. Nor was Mrs. Amory any more what you would have supposed. She had a long talk with Mr. Hunt pronounced him a fine, intelligent young fellow, and expressed the conviction that he could manage Fifi if anybody could. And his father was not a crusty old farmer, but the president of a bank in Kansas City. And he himself could grow up in a bank if he liked. But he didn't like, because he was an inventor, and interested Mr. Amory immensely the first hour with an account of an entirely new, non-inflammable film he had invented, which was going to revolutionize the motion picture industry. Indeed, he became highly popular with the entire family, and Patsy flirted shamelessly with him, which embarrassed him horribly, and Pips wanted to model his head for the sake of the sittings. But Fifi loved him, as she had never loved anything on earth, and prayed every night on her knees that she might make him a good wife, which, so far as I know, she did. End of section 15 Recording by Capricia Page